Thanks to the organizers, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, so, I'm the last talk today, so and I come from Berkeley, so just sit back and relax. I will talk to, uh, about the crazy stuff as we do coming from Berkeley. Um, so I will ta also talk about um, learning in closed sensor motor loops. And we have actually seen a lot of talks today talking about the control theory um, <coughs> that you can do in order to understand that. And so basically, um, uh, you already saw this diagram. This is of the Sutton and Bartle book about reinforcement learning. So in the standard setting, you basically uh, describe the environment by a Markov decision process that has a reward built in. It comes out of the, the environment, basically. It's usually a constant function. And um, <coughs> then if you actually don't know the, env uh, the environment, you have to learn it. And the dilemma arises then exploitation versus exploration, right? So we have heard that it's all clear. And it is in this setting, a lot of the theories that we have today about how learning functions in closed sensor motor loop is in this setting. Uh, quite sophisticated uh, theories using uh, variational principles like the free energy principles, sampling, we have heard from Bert. I mean, there's a lot of very interesting and powerful stuff out there. I will, in the reminder of this talk, fully concentrate on the exploration part and almost forget about the exploitation. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and so, I will show you a movie. And um, so this is on a, on a roof in Russia. <coughs> and you see a bird that has a piece of plastic <laughs> and engages with it. <laughs> Tries to get further if it gets stuck in the snow and seems to enjoy this. So what's going on here? So um, it's a pretty sophisticated behavior, but there's no external reward. And we don't know how this world came to actually develop this behavior, but we can guess. And it seems that it really relies on at least two things. So first, it it, it needed to have a certain internal drive to explore the, the, the properties and affordances of the environment. For example, this piece of trash. That's point one. And point two is then, it's not enough, right? Point two is then to kind of form a focus in an intrinsic value for some of these discovered affordances. You know, sledding a snowy roof with a piece of plastic and rehearse and play this, right? And this is what we saw in the movie. And I think the second point no one has really addressed. It's very complicated. It probably, I mean, this, this formation of a focus of such a discovered affordance is probably involves things like Gestalt principles. I don't know. And I, I don't know of anyone who has good theories about that. So I will not touch that. I would love to, but I will not. I cannot. I will just um, basically uh, deal with the first point and ask a little bit, you know, what uh, can be internal drives for exploration? And you might say, okay, this is a very, a very arcane example and we don't need to think about this, and I would disagree. I think there are other examples in behaviors. There is playing children. It was analyzed. It was, um, um, actually studied by uh, Corinne Hutt in the 1970s, recently by my colleague at Berkeley, by Alison Gopnik. Um, and uh, actually, uh, uh, Corinne Hutt introduced these two phases of discovery and rehearsal play that was actually um, for uh, describing play in children. Um, <clears throat> I also think that um, art and creativity that we see uh, you know, there are composers who work with the material, there are sculptors who work with a certain wood and, and use the properties of this to create such a thing. So I think it's not always true that we have this top-down goal, independent of everything, and then we just try to, to control the world to get it there. It's very important that there is this uh, discovery of what's out there, and then we work with it. 
<laughs> so I would. Is, is very is a very strong part of the theory. I mean, it's not ignored at all. The, all those uh, information. Yeah, yeah no, no. I will. I will get to that. I'm not saying. No, I'm not saying that. You're right. right. No. Um, <clears throat> then of course there's um, exploratory behavior in animals. It's actually uh, by Ehud uh, in, in uh, his former postdoc. Uh, um, uh, uh, Goran, they had a, a papers on, on actually trying to understand, uh, understand uh, exploration of, of rats using kind of a, a nested loop model. And also the eye movements in support of a visual task that actually Daniel described before. So what I will tell you today is um, I will tell you a little bit about a field that did actually not come up so much and it's a, a field of statistics, optimal experimental design. And, uh, and then we'll basically um, <coughs> just go through two simple models of information-driven sequential OED models, um, and then show you some simulation results with su such a model, uh, actually in uh, agents who explore very simple environments, and then also I'll tell you a little bit about extensions of these methods to unbounded state spaces. And, um, <coughs> These are all very simple and abstract models. They just have kind of conditional probability kernels in them. Last part, I will shift a little bit gears and tell you a little bit about uh, neural implement, uh, potential neural implementations of such models by actually compressed sensing and dictionary learning. That's another <coughs> area we, where we have some results in my lab. So, um, optimal experimental design. Stiegler, uh, a historian, he actually made the connection that already in the book of Daniel, there's a very good example of optimal, optimal experimental design. Daniel prove, wants to prove that his diet of vegetables is actually better than the delicacies of, uh, that King Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, consumes. And he suggests uh, in a very detailed fashion how the, the servants of the king could be used as subjects. Uh, and then there's in 1815 already, there are models that, um, uh, um, that there's this paper by Gregon that actually describes how if you have a mathematical model of regression, how you should actually choose your sample points. So it's very interesting, it's probably the oldest field of statistics. But what <coughs> gets very interesting for us is actually sequential uh, uh, optimal experimental design. And uh, there is uh, the, the seminal paper by Lindley, an st uh, English statistician in the 50s, and then uh, a book by Fedorov in the 70s, and then finally this paper by David McKay in the 90s. <coughs> and that's basically something I will follow here. And uh, so the idea of sequential opti optimal design is pretty clear. You basically, <coughs> in order to, you perform an experiment and then you use your data basically to, uh, in a model maybe, and you kind of use it to design uh, the next experiment, right? That's, that's obvious. the se sequential pro progression that we are all in science very well used to. And of course the idea is that this could be a, a, a model for, for, for learning in the brain. <coughs> and maybe also a, a principle how we could build machines that can actually autonomically learn. And uh, so this is probably the densest slide, but you don't have to uh, go, you don't have to go, uh, so it's basically just you, you have the n is, is n observations x1 to xn that you already have. Um, in a learning context you could imagine them to be drawn from a, from a ground truth, p of the n. And uh, now you basically can um, just use the chain rule to build up a model for the, for, 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 for the uh, posterior distribution q of the n given theta. And um, <coughs> then kind of build such a, an iterative equation that, that, that computes what happens to this posterior if you add a new data point xn plus 1. And uh, then basically the idea of, of, of um, what the drive, the internal drive could be for the exploration is this predicted information gain, which is basically um, the pullback Leibler divergence between uh, the the, the, the current model, um, Q of the current posterior is Q of theta given dn, and a fictitious posterior that has <coughs> one new fictitious uh, observation, the xn plus 1 data point included. 
And then you basically take the conditional expectation. Okay, so that's basically the expected information gain if you have already n sampling points and you get another one. Okay? And that could be a candidate that actually could be used to select an action for a next exploration use. We just com compute this for all the actions that you, the sampling actions you can do. And this um, has been done. There are some work by Schmidt Huber's group. Um, um, E.T. and Baldi have kind of called this uh, base and surprise. Uh, and there is some very recent work in sequential uh, optimal experimental design by Juan and Marsuk, who use some very sophisticated machine learning techniques to do this. So that's kind of an active field. We don't know so much about this, but I think it's very interesting for us. Um, okay, and so, I mean, we, uh, what we did in the, in a, a 2013 paper, actually, we, to, we took um, a similar approach. We uh, kind of said, okay, um, P of X is the ground rules, Q of X is my estimate, and uh, then actually there are uh, some papers of the 70s, this paper by Pfaffelhuber, where he basically defines the missing information just as the kuhlberg leibler divergence between, of, uh, between P and X and Q and X. And so now you can basically also form this conditional expectation of this missing information. And uh, you end then up with something that fortunately doesn't depend on the ground rules uh, anymore. So it's the, the lower line here. So it's, ex it's basically, again, a, such a surprise term. It's kind of, um, again, that this, your current model to predict the, the data point x and uh, the, um, and then the first term in the kuhlberg library is the current, is basically the, the, the current data plus one additional fictitious data point included. And um, so this is another suggestion how to compute these uh, uh, predicted information gains. Is it not the same? It's not the same. So, so I'm just showing you here what it is. So basically one is, is the mutual information of the new, so the, so the, so the McKay version is the uh, mutual conditioned information between xn plus 1 and the parameters theta, given the data. And the oh, other so one, the okay. yeah, and the other one okay. is the mutual information between two new data points, given the data. So it's not the same. But I don't know what's better. We use the second, but I'm just telling you, it's bo both out there. You can both, both use it. For the first one, of course, it depends on the parameterization. It depends on the parameters. Um, OK. And uh, so basically, now we basically just said, OK, what can we do with this? And how does it actually help? Can we explore in, in, in basically uh, uh, some simple test environments how well an agent would do and uh, how this would compare to some simpler ways to actually gather data. And so in the philosophy of this work, we use uh, uh, not an MDP, but we use just an MDP minus the reward function. So it's basically a controllable Markov chain. And then basically uh, the estimate uh, distributions, the Qs, they are just histogram parameter, parameterized by these theta, so it's all pretty simple. So theta hat is the estimate, and the ground truth is theta. And, um, and now we basically say, okay, uh, we uh, study uh, three worlds in which an agent can move. Uh, one is just uh, this ring of pretty dense uh, connections, uh, kind of uh, probabilistic connections, uh, transition connections. Um, and the middle one is, is kind of a maze where the agent at every point, at every number in the maze has four different options of actions that correspond in a stochastic way uh, to up, down, uh, left and right. And uh, this third world is one where the three actions are quite different in terms of their stochasticity. So the first is just one deterministic um, uh, action in the, the uh, a, a transition with, with action one, but action three is basically uh, with probability one third, it goes to three different states. Um, and so now basically if you set up these little um, agents, uh, of course, we need uh, to do inference. We need to integrate the data as they come in. And then the second thing is 
um, basically to implement an exploration strategy that would now depend on um, the, this information measure that I described. And so for the inference, we just use Bayesian inference that actually minimizes um, <coughs> the um, missing information. And, uh, and then um, for the exploration strategies, so um, in, in this maze you see now these gray wedges. So this is now after T exploration st steps, you basically stop the exploration. And, we, and, and uh, basically the gray level of the wedge tells you the, the amount of missing information. And so there's one particularity about this maze, it has an absorbing state, which is all these three concentric rings. And whenever you actually run into one of these blue vo uh, wall doors, you actually end up in the, in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the absorbing state. And so for that reason, there is all, there's no missing information near the absorbing state, because every time it falls in the absorbing state, it somehow it's, it has to get out again. But away from this absorbing state, you actually still have a, a lot of missing information. And uh, we will now, I, I will now show you a lot of calls that just show you how the missing information decreases. And uh, to kind of gauge this a little bit, what is good, what is bad, we have two controls. One is just random action, so that's what's often done in the exploration exploitation. Uh, the theotomy is kind of the simplest thing you can do, and of course for us this is kind of the baseline. If you can't do better than, than random action, than a model-based uh, a model -based, uh, strategy that doesn't do better than random action is idiotic, right? And the other one is actually an, an unembodied um, uh, explorer that uses um, <coughs> predicted information gain. And with unembodied, I mean that usually the uh, explorer sits in a certain state, makes a certain action, and that causes him to transit, and then he has to sample from that, the state he ended up with uh, the next time. And um, an unembodied uh, explorer is, is, is one in which uh, the, the explorer can choose its sampling state and its action, not only the action. And that, of course, makes it much easier. Yeah. So if I understand this, this setup is agnostic of any performance task yes. thing. So you right. want to learn everything. Exactly. Not task specific. So for yeah. a, in a, it's very different from abandoned setting, for instance. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so to, to show you what these control strategies do for the three worlds, um, you see that they fall on top of each other in these dense worlds, worlds so there is actually no margin where you can expect any improvement from, from uh, model-based exploration. But in the mazes and in these, in these, uh, on the right side in these worlds, you actually see that it's quite so that the, the better the learning curve, the, the, the faster it drops off. So the, the black line is the, the drop off of the missing information achieved by the unembodied explorer. And the red lines are from the random explorers. And so now we can basically send the agents in, in, the, in the race that are embodied but use this, this information measure and we can see how well they do. Um, this is just a, some course that shows you that basically this prediction works pretty well. This is the predicted information gain versus the actually realized information gains. Um, in this, now the green curve shows you um, the performance of uh, the, the embodied explorer with predicted information gain. And you can see for mazes that's a big disappointment, right? So I mean, it's not significantly different from, from random exploring. That's um, not good. And so what's really important uh, in these more complicated worlds is that uh, you don't use this objective in a greedy fashion. You have to do it with, um, uh, with value iteration, basically, as um, Bert explained before. So you cannot just, uh, just take the action that, that, maxi that kind of maximizes the information gain for the next step. So you have really to plan ahead. And this is, this is to, uh, basically done by the Bellman equations. And so if you do that, so Bert already explained the Bellman equations. If you put that in, then we can actually see that uh, uh, now PIG with value iteration, that means 
using the Bellman equation and a finite time horizon for the optimization, that now really gets, gets you um, significantly better. So this, this is the green curve with the round symbols. So you can see this does now in both of these worlds where there is some margin of improvement using the model, it really does something for you. And um, this basically compares, so again, the green guy with the, uh, um, with the, the sorting symbols is, the, is, the, is this value iterated PIG. And these are just other um, strategies, at least taken action, counter based, and other. Um, so, and you can see uh, that basically this uh, information driven exploration works pretty well. And then, but then of course you can say, okay, what does it mean? I mean, you just kind of optimize with respect to that KL. Does this really mean something? And so we also tr um, compared now, well, if you train a, 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 an agent using this, this principle and then you give it a reinforcement task, right? For, for example, a navigation task or a reward collecting task. How does it actually perform compared to other reinforcement strategies that learn the same amount of time steps with this particular reinforcement learning perspective? And this is kind of shown here. And this is a complicated figure, but it basically, um, so the, the, the green dot is kind of this, this value iterated PIG. And one can see that basically it is in, it is, it is kind of in this, in this, so everything in the box is stuff that does equally well. And there are the unembodied strategies and, uh, um, and also the, the boss reinforcement learner, which is pretty good, but most of the other reinforcement strategies are actually worse. Um, so, so good, uh, low rank is, is, uh, is actually good here. So near, near the uh, origin of the diagrams. The exploration and the task, they're separate. Yeah, for our, uh, for our learn, they're separated. So we basically, we say, okay, you uh, explore first, and then we give you the task. We could intertwine. We, yeah, we could. Yes. Okay, so yeah, th this works, but of course we cheated here a little bit. And the cheating was, of course, we gave the explorer uh, a, a very important piece of information that an explorer really cannot have. And this is the, 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 the uh, size of the maze. And so therefore, we, uh, in the NIPS paper, we extended this work and we said, okay, let's not do that. That's kind of so I mean, if you if you are an explore, explorer, you don't know how big the world is or whatever you explore. You don't know it. That's why you explore. And so we basically use uh, kind of the Chinese restaurant pr process that basically always leaves a certain probability mass to uh, the uh, basically the situation where you discover a new state that you haven't seen before, and that has kind of a free parameter of theta. I shouldn't have called this it's too many thetas in this talk. Um, so, and then we either set theta to one fixed value or we use an empirical base optimization to, to maximize the likelihood of the, of the currently seen data. This is then an adaptive way, a, a theta of t, this last equation gives you an adaptive way to actually set this free parameter. And this we call the empirical base version of the explorer. Um, and we also have to do a little bit of bookkeeping now, of course, if new states are um, are, uh, 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 can be explored, uh, uh, you basically have to do some petting to, to still compute the KLs. And there is some arbitrarieties there, so there are several ways to do this. I will not go into the details here. Um, but then you basically get these learning curves, and so the, the left learning curve shows you what happens if you, uh, uh, if you put now this CLP uh, um, 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 agent in a, in a um, bounded maze and uh, then you get basically the purple uh, in, in the, the black line I think in the blue line the best uh, the best um, uh, the best embodied performer is, is the blue line this is actually the uh, explorer that has the site information you shouldn't have so yeah I mean you take a certain hit but still the learning costs are pretty good and if you do uh, really, if, if, you, if you put now the, the explorer really in a very big maze that it's, it's in, in essence unbounded, then this, this um, uh, 
empirical base uh, guy on the right diagram, you see the purple line does a little bit better than, uh, than the fixed parameters. We kind of optimized this fixed parameter a little bit. But, um, so, um, but it's nice to use the empirical base because then you, you don't have to care about the setting of the free parameter. And so the last picture here just shows you a little bit how um, So th th these are now bigger mazes, and you can basically on the left side you see the CLP agent, and on the right side you see a least taken action example. And you see here that the agent on the left side explored more. But of course there is now another interesting balance, and this is the, the balance between how widely do you try to explore to find new states versus how to actually navigate the already discovered state. And you could certainly, I mean, I think with this padding procedure that we have there, we could, we could tweak this balance a little bit. So I'm just saying this exploration can, if you, if you, if you make this a little bit more, uh, I mean, if you make it model driven, then this exploration gets its own life somehow. Um, okay, um, so, so far um, I have basically shown you that um, you could basically, you could, you, 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 you can actually use the sequential optimal experimental design methods to, to, to do this exploration. But of course, it's still, it's a, it's a, it's a model, it's not, not at all clear how this would be impl implemented uh, neurally. And so, therefore, I will now switch a little bit gears and tell you about some other work that we did, um, which. Um, so there was one paper by Zach Pitkov, a newspaper in 2012, and he made the point that actually uh, compressed sensing is, a, is an interesting way to represent uh, high dimensional probability uh, 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 distributions where you basically the mass is pretty sparse and that if you go in high dimensions this is almost always the case. And uh, so, but now um, how many of you know uh, compressed sensing? Yeah, so I should, I should say something about it. So um, if you look at this picture in the middle, it contain, contains a lot of pixels. And so you can either downsample that just by kind of making the pixels bigger and averaging within the pixel. And that's shown on the left side. And it's an interesting uh, psychophysics phenomenon on its own that actually people dis uh, re can recognize Lincoln, Lincoln also in this le left picture. But nevertheless, the quality is some, somewhat impaired on the left side. And, um, and so basically, uh, compressed sensing explo uh, exploits some, some statistical properties of images to actually do a better compression so that you actually can use n numbers without losing all the high. And, um, and basically how this is done is basically you can, for example, create random ma masks that look like these on the right side, n of them, form n times the inner product and write this in a vector. And you can, under certain assumption, then decode the full image without any loss. Okay? And how is this done? Um, so the compression I just explained to you, it's linear and super simple. That was, is also kind of a selling point of compressed sensing that you could do it in the field without doing any sophisticated, you could have cameras and some very stupid computation of, on, on, the, on the location. And you can just send these compressed images. So basically, why is the compressed image? Phi is now a matrix that can be used. And, um, and in, in essence, what this phi matrix, the conditions that it has to fulfill is that um, there is, uh, if, and, and yeah, this, so the first thing that has to be fulfilled is that the, uh, th that the data has a sparse representation. So the image itself is not sparse, but you can actually have a dictionary psi so that actually x equals psi a, and a is now a sparse vector. And if this vector is, let's say, k sparse, so it has only k non-zero elements and its dimension is much, much bigger than k, and it's sparse, um, then uh, basically the, the condition for the sampling matrix is that um, at least 2k or, or more rows must be always required to represent one of the other rows of the matrix. 
Um, this is called the SPA condition, and a random matrix is a good candidate for actually fulfilling that condition. And so now I explained you basically how to compress and what you need, what phi matrix you need, and what's the condition on the X on the data. So they need to, to be sparse in this, in this fashion that you can write it uh, psi times A, but A is a sparse vector. And so I can uh, um, also the, this, this, uh, uh, this E of A equation basically gives you the objective function how to, to kind of reconstruct the, the image from its compressed version. So basically you have to solve this lasso problem, you have to, um, <coughs> to optimize this, uh, to minimize this, this, this function in, in the A that gives you a better sparse vector. Uh, if for example you put in a sparsity constraint like the uh, L1 norm of the vector and then if you know the dictionary of, of, of your data you can just multiply it with the dictionary and this gives you the, the data. So that's kind of a, an interesting idea. And um, we thought first about this in the context of actually cortical cortical communication. So, if you, uh, so here in the, on the upper picture you see basically uh, neurons that sit in, in this case in the superficial layer and that actually uh, send uh, fibers to another brain region. And um, it is likely that for many of these projections in the brain uh, this is again a bottleneck problem. So you have actually a rather small number of these neurons that, with the black bodies that sit in the, in the sending region uh, compared to the number of neurons that can represent information there. And so it's kind of intriguing to think about that maybe what these, what these uh, projecting neurons do with their dendrites is kind of a sampling like with this random matrix. And uh, so the idea is now that, ba and this is in the lower picture, but that basically you have uh, some um, local activity pattern in the same region. It's a sparse vector, it's very long, uh, but rather sparse activity. And that then basically the, 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 the A matrix is kind of the synaptic ma uh, matrix in the dendrites of these projecting neurons. Uh, they basically make a much shorter y vector of this, uh, of this large A pattern. This is then sent through the, through the fibers. And now, of course, if the receiver region would have uh, uh, some very critical side information, it could just apply the, the, the compressed sensing trick. But it would need to know the A matrix. It would need to know the sampling matrix. And that's, of course, not likely not clear how this information would be propagated. So what we explored is under what conditions can you actually, rather than plugging in the A matrix, under what conditions can you learn the A matrix. So basically if you just are bombarded with some compressed data, how can you actually, um, under what conditions can you do dictionary learning and r discover the A, vector, uh, the A vectors in the A matrix um, up to a permutation because the numbering of the neurons is only used. And so that was basically some, um, something that was actually not explored. So a lot of people have explored compressed sensing, but this combination of dictionary learning and compressed sensing was not so well understood. And this is uh, something that I, I did with Chris Hiller, a postdoc at the time in my lab. And so we basically, um, but what we found was that basically under the same condition under which uh, compressed sensing works, you can also do the learning. So if you don't have the, actually the, the sampling matrix, you can learn it. <coughs> you need, of course, a lot of, 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 of examples. So you need a lot of unsupervised learning, but you need a lot of some, uh, examples. And so we also could kind of come up with, with at least upper bounds how many examples you need. But um, <coughs> this is an, an idea how you could actually, in a quite compact fashion, uh, transmit these co conditional probability distributions. And it's, a, it's, of course, another proposal to many others in, 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 uh, in the literature. But what we did then is to test this idea um, by um, looking at a decoding, <coughs> uh, decoding problem in the hippocampus. So, in the hippocampus of a navigating rat, you basically have very, uh, during the navigation phase, you have a very high 9 hertz uh, local field potential. It has very high power. 
And so basically what we asked is, if um, we use data, we use data from actually the Busaki lab, so that's, they had very nice multi-electrodes, about you know, 64 electrodes or even more, implanted in CA1 and CA3 of the hippocampus. And so you could do actually spike sorting in the high frequency regime of these recordings and, uh, and then actually decode where the animal is at every point in time. And so we asked now, what, what if you just um, bandpass filter around nine hertz. Can we somehow apply these methods and actually decode where the animal is at every point in time? And I mean, that is, um, in a way, it's, 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 it's an even crazier way how the, the, how the signals are downsampled and mixed because now we are not recording from all projecting neurons, we are just putting some electrodes nearby some neurons and recording from these neurons. And, but it has also some, some, some practical benefits because if you, could, if you could really decode reliably from the LFP, you don't rely on spike sorting, which is very brittle with movements of the electrodes and so on. And so um, let me just um, jump here. So yeah, and so one problem, of course, in the hippocampus is that a decoding of uh, local field potentials is more difficult than, for example, in primary visual cortex of, of let's say, um, monkeys, because you have, there you have orientation columns. And even if you receive a little bit of a, a, a mixed signal from a, a certain area in V1, it likely still has an orientation <coughs> preference, and you can actually use this to decode. But in the hippocampus, the place cells are salt, salt and pepper. So if, 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 uh, if two neighboring neurons, if you look at their place fields, they are in arbitrary positions in the environment. They are not neighbors. I mean, I mean the, the place fields are not neighbors in the environment. Therefore, there is no topography. So this doesn't help you. So re you really need to do this demixing, to, to get this demixing right. And uh, yeah, and the interesting um, finding is then, and this is a, um, is there a laser pointer? Yes, no, I mean, Need to find it either. No. No. Okay. So this is uh, this is basically the rat. Uh, uh, it's a linear maze. So a rat running right, losses left, and um, and now basically what you can see here. These are so. And now we basically just um, took the uh, recorded signals. Uh, Bandpass filled them at 9 volts, and then we basically applied kind of a sparse coding. And this is exactly the process that I described to you before in this, in this model of communication between, between two brain regions, what's, what happens in the uh, receiver brain region. And then we actually get sparse components, and they are very distributed in the, uh, in, in, in the, uh, in the electrode array but they are very nicely organized in the behavioral space. So you basically see here, these are now the activations of different sparse components that you get as the animal runs here to the left. And so you basically get a tidy set of sparse components that tell you where the animal is. And you can actually use this to decoding, and here you see basically true position versus estimated position. This is basically with spikes, this is with these LFPs, and this is basically here we left out channels. So this is 100% of, I think, 64 electrodes. This is then 32, and uh, this is 16. And so you can see that there is a, a more graceful degradation as you leave channels out, which is nice. And uh, yeah, but that, that the information is all there and can be decoded. OK, to sum up, um, yeah, so I told you a little bit about uh, basically theories of guided explorations, and, and I really think they are required in neuroscience. To some extent, also, people think the brain is too simple if we don't have good theories of these, uh, you know, pretty sophisticated ways how, how a model can be used already in exploration. Um, and um, because, I mean, this is, is the key to understand, you know, and to, uh, kind of also creativity and, and you know, some, some properties that we think, you know, some animals and ourselves have to some extent. Um, then I, I basically sh um, showed you um, s some sequential optimal explorable design uh, methods that use uh, information gain and showed you some very simple uh, uh, simulation experiments that just show that these 
uh, these, these models do in these, in these artificial and very simple toy experiments pretty well, that this can be extended to unbounded discrete state spaces. That is definitely very important also if you want to think about continuous state spaces and discretization of those, then it will be imp very important that you can increase the state space as you go in order to, uh, to, 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 to improve the discretization in, in regions of the state space where you need it. Um, yeah, and in the last uh, point, I, I, I yeah, try to convey you a little bit this idea of how actually this combination of dictionary learning and compressed sensing could be actually used to, uh, in your coding. Okay, thanks very much.